We are in 2 Peter chapter 1. We're in the last quality that we have been looking at in, in uh, verses 5 through 7. We're on love. We want to read that passage, 5 through 9. We have today, we have next week as we think about that quality called love and what Peter is uh, addressing here and what we might further learn about it in a biblical fashion. Let's look at that together. I invite you to follow along with me. Peter writes, Now for this very reason also, applying all diligence in your faith, supply moral excellence, and in your moral excellence, knowledge, and in your knowledge, self-control, and in your self-control, perseverance, and in your perseverance, godliness, and in your godliness, brotherly kindness, and in your brotherly kindness, love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these qualities is blind or short-sighted, having forgotten his purification from his former sins. May the Lord bless his word to our lives that we might grow thereby. We looked a little bit last time at a couple places in 1 John, and we want to revisit those, especially uh, 1 John 4.10. We're going to see 1 John 3.16 here in a minute. And I think it is very crucial for us to understand <coughs> this quality called love that Peter wants, to, wants us to be diligent to bring into our lives and have it increase. In this is love, not that we loved God. Okay? We need to get that. We did not love God. Uh, we tried everything, substituting everything we could think of uh, for who God is. Even today, humanity has uh, trouble uh, inventing God or thinking that uh, well, in my opinion, God should be like this. Well, we don't get to give our opinions in that regard. He reveals himself, and it's so crucial we understand that. God reveals who he is to us in his word. It is not left to our imagination. When it is left to our imaginations, what does it devolve into? It devolves into idolatry. And so we have to be very careful, beloved. So it is not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. So crucial. This is the first verse. We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us. And what we're beginning to address today then is that last phrase of the verse, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. He loved us, laid down his life for us. What does that mean for us? Well, we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. And that encapsulates for us what love is all about. Love, then, is consistent with God's character. It's who he is. God is love. He's many other things. We talk about that in terms of his attributes, right? But he is love. It's an essential quality that he has. It is consistent with God's plan and purpose. He sent his son, you see. He loved us and he sent his son. So it is consistent with who he is as God, and it is consistent with his plan and purpose in that he sent his son into the world. He loved the world, and he gave his only begotten son. And it is consistent with God's justice. Sorry about that. I don't know why that appeared. It usually doesn't. Consistent with God's justice. He is the propitiation for our sins. 
he was angry with us and justifiably angry with us in our rebellion, our rebellion against him. And in love, he sends his son and fulfills his justice. Right? Does that make sense? Fulfills our justice, or for, for, fulfills justice. He cannot violate it, and he has to solve it. It wasn't a problem for him. And he does so in his son. <coughs> that is the appeal. That, beloved, is the appeal. And when we talk about love, that is what we are talking about. God's love, we said last time, was not some favorable feel-good vibe that he had of us. Rather, we deserved eternal death as his enemies. You've got to get that. It's got to be clear to you. We deserved it. We were not lovable people. We were rebellious people, utterly sinful in his sight. And I know it goes against the grain of our pride to think that, well, certainly there was something good in me. You know, we're so desperate to find it, but that is not the case. But, beloved, that's what magnifies God's love so much more. We were unlovable, and yet he chose to set his love upon us. If we were waiting for a favorable, feel-good vibe from God, I believe we'd still be waiting. So we need to understand that. It is on display when Christ took the penalty on our behalf, redemption, he set us free. He set us free unto new life. Atonement, forgiveness of sins, and propitiation. He paid the penalty vicariously, that is, he died in our stead in our place. He took upon himself the penalty that you deserved and in love accepted that to fulfill God's justice and be the propitiation for our sins and assuaged God's wrath. Again, we were caught in the slave market of sin without hope of release. And being all in the same encampment, there was no one among us that could do anything to free us from it. And so God took it upon himself to do it in sending his son, and he placed him within the encampment, yet without sin. And he took our sin upon himself so that in him we might be set free from it. And it's important to understand that because our love springs forth from the root of God's love and is reflected in consistency in embracing God and his attributes, among which are love, because of the great love with which he loved me and because he sent his son, I, I gladly take on these characteristics. He wants to transform my life. He doesn't want to just free me from the penalty of sin. He wants to free me from the power of sin so that I, like him, might set my love on others. It is reflected in consistency in embracing God's plan and purpose to save his people and make all things new. And it is reflected in consistency in embracing what God says. That is, he says in John 14, 21, he who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. 
If you love me, you'll do what I say. You'll follow me. You'll embrace my ways. We do so, again, because God acted first. God intervened first, not the other way around. Now, our Lord, in, in ministering toward the end of his ministry, he was dealing with the Sadducees and the Pharisees and the scribes and the priests and all the people involved, the leadership and the people at, at large, questions are asked and he asks a question at the end but he's asked a very important question he's asked about the greatest command what is the greatest command that's right that's right you spilled the beans that's right there were arguments among the religious elite about what is the greatest command we talked about that previously. In fact, in Luke, it's revealed that it's a lawyer who stands up and puts him to the test. And asks it a different way. He says, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, what is written in the law? How does it read to you? And he answers, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and so on and so on. Here in Matthew, Jesus replies, and he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. <clears throat> the whole law and the prophets. They hang on the two great commandments. To love God with every facet of your being. And to love your neighbor as yourself. <clears throat> this is another thing that sort of flies in the face of society. Society often has the notion or idea that part of this person's problem is he doesn't love himself enough. Probably what part of the problem is, is he loves himself too much. And he's unwilling to see his life in the context of otherness, especially in terms of his relationship to God. And what do we mean by we love ourselves? Sometimes, sometimes I don't have a, a favorable feeling about myself, but why is that? That's the question you have to ask. It's not the feeling that we are addressing, the symptoms. We want to get to the core of what's going on. And nine times out of ten, what is it? that I hate about myself because I'm guilty. I have a guilty conscience. I don't like how I'm living. I don't like what's going on in my life and I don't know what to do about it. And I hate it and I loathe it. And yet it, I'm stuck in it and I keep doing it over and over again. The same old thing, the same cycle, everything about it. I don't want to oversimplify, but part of the answer is love God and love your neighbor. Start getting outside of yourself. Start thinking about others and the good of others and sacrificing for others and doing something just to do it for someone else Love your neighbor as yourself. You take care of yourself, usually. Sometimes we take too much care of ourselves. We look after ourselves, our concerns, and so on. But when we 
are so involved or overly involved in that, we become closed off and we are no longer other-oriented. The commands of God to love God, love our neighbor, get us outside of ourselves to others. To cherish others. To set my love on someone else. To sacrifice on behalf of another. So the two great commandments hang on these commands. Love God, love your neighbor. If you're doing that, you fulfill the law. That's what the scripture says. It is the whole law and the prophet. And it is the whole law and the prophets that speak of Jesus Christ. How does it speak of Jesus? Luke, I didn't have it in the notes here, but Luke 24, focusing in on verse 26. Was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things? And to enter into his glory. As the two disciples on the road to Emmaus were amazed that this gentleman that had encountered them didn't know what had gone on. And they explained to him all these things. And, and then he begins to open the scriptures to them. Was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things? And to enter into his glory. The next verse says. Then beginning with Moses. And with all the prophets. He explained to them the things concerning himself. In all the scripture. In his suffering. And in his exaltation. From Genesis up through the prophets. And so it speaks of. Him taking on human flesh. Philippians chapter 2. He took upon himself humanity. But not just humanity. As a bond servant. To serve and to go to, to the point of death. Even death on a cross. His suffering. The trials. The temptations. The testings. Everything that went into it. Yet remaining sinless. Bearing it all. Because God sent him into the world because he loved the world and that he would redeem his people, even his enemies. And then his exaltation and glory. He was victorious and in that great act of love the Father was pleased and so he was highly exalted and given what? A name above every name. What does it mean to love God and your neighbor? Well, it, it sits right there in Christ's humiliation and exaltation and what he did on our behalf and how we are to take that up in our own lives and love God and love our neighbor. For those are the two great commandments upon which all the scriptures hang. <clears throat> and so the point, obeying the two great commands of loving God and loving your neighbor, is of necessity an embracing of God's definition of love. God's definition of of love as revealed in the cross as manifested in the life, death and exaltation of Jesus Christ <clears throat> so beloved in your worship in your interaction with others we need to remember the love of God is at stake. The love of God is at stake.
God loved you, set his love on you. He asked you to do that in turn to your neighbor, to God himself, to your neighbor, and even to your enemies, even your enemies. As an aside, that's something that in uh, marriage counseling that is often referred to, if you can't love your husband or your wife as your husband and wife, and you can't love them as your neighbor, God says to love them as your enemy. So you can't escape it, you see. There is a fundamental quality of which you are to engage others, and that is love. Peter has covered everything. Faith, knowledge, virtue, godliness, self-control, perseverance, uh, brotherly kindness, how we behave amongst ourselves, and now love takes us beyond the four walls, so to speak, to our neighbor, to our neighbor. And the love of God is at stake. The one we represent and the message we bring of love is not empty or vacuous, but centers on the totality of what Christ did. So to say that we have a message of love is true. It is true. We do have a message of love. But this message of love must ever be tied to Christ and the cross. It's not just we have a message of love, this favorable feeling toward everyone magically. And if we would all just develop this wonderful feeling for everyone else, we'd be okay in society. That is not the message of love that we have. It is tied to Christ and the cross. To say we have a message of love that is void of the message that Christ came to pay the penalty for sin and save sinners is no message of love. Do you understand that? It's okay then to say we have a message of love, but it is within a particular context that it must be understood. And a life lived that is void of that is no love at all. Is no love at all. Now I want to compare it to godliness a little bit as we close. If you remember when we talked about godliness, we talked about godliness in terms of uh, of a properly grand view of God. When you develop a properly grand view of who God is, as he, re as he has revealed himself in the scriptures, the result is a transformation in your behavior. That is godliness. You hear godly in there? Godliness. It's being like him as you have a greater and greater understanding of his grandness. So I thought about that in regard to love. Love is a result of a properly grand view of what God accomplished in Christ. Godliness and the way I behave, I want to be like him. It's a properly grand view of him. And now I develop a properly grand view of what he accomplished on my behalf. A sinner, an enemy, rebellious, a hard heart. And I see what he has done on my behalf. 
how can I not but help be that way to others? It's hard. It's hard. But I believe that is what Peter, or what more importantly our Lord calls us to through Peter. What did he accomplish becoming our substitute and taking upon himself the penalty? The penalty I deserved. And becoming an atonement for sin, setting us free, that we may in turn love God and love our neighbor. Our Father in heaven, thank you for your word to us. Thank you for what it means, this word love, and, and setting it in a proper context for us. And Lord, in our feebleness, in our our weakness, we pray that you would help us, help us in developing a properly grand view of who you are and a properly grand view of what you accomplished. And we'll give you the glory for how you continue to transform us and what you do through us in loving you and loving our neighbor. And we pray this through Christ our Lord.